you came from California, so just um, explain what brought you to Yavapai College. Uh, I came from California to teach at Orm School during their Fine Arts Festival. And uh, over a period of several years, I came to really like Prescott and the Square, and so I would stop and eat my lunch at the Courthouse Square mm -hmm. and before I would drive out to Mayer and Orm School. And uh, one of the years, as I passed through in the late 60s, I noticed they started building a campus here. So I stopped and I interviewed with the Dean of Instruction, which was uh, Dr. Joseph Russo at the time. And uh, one thing led to another. Uh, I went back to California, where I was an art supervisor of a large school district. And uh, Dr. Russo wrote me and offered me a job. So I took a sabbatical leave and came to Prescott. And uh, after a year of being here, I decided to quit my California job, and I've been here ever since. I'm perfectly happy with the decision. <laughs> to come over here. So when you came to Yavapai College and uh, you started in the art department, uh, what was it like? What did you start? Uh, the art department was, was one classroom above the library, which is in the building we're in now. And it was a uh, drawing and painting experience taught by Mr. Ed Branson. And that was the size of it. Came uh, Vince Kelly, and I joined the faculty as full-time faculty. And the first uh, classes we taught were in Building 4. In what was the homemaking room, we turned it into a ceramic studio mm. and a classroom which is, uh, became an auto shop lecture classroom and where I taught everything from woodworking to leather to metalsmithing. And we taught there a year and then after that Building 5 was constructed and we started the uh, crafts program in Building 5 and the wood program still uh, uses that facility currently. Oh, that's great. So um, explain the two bond elections that you went through when you were here at the, the first bond election uh, was conducted by uh, Dr. Heiserut uh, under the auspices of Dr. Paul Walker, and it was a bond election to expand the <clears throat> Clarkdale campus and to build the performance hall and several other buildings. And the second bond election was the the more recent one uh, that has renovated the college after nearly 30 years, uh, more than 30 years, I guess. And the bond election was conducted by Dr. Daly, President Daly. So those are the two. One was to build a performance hall, uh, and this one was to renovate, renovate the entire um uh, the campuses across the county. And so did you see, when that happened, did you see an expansion in the art department as well? Um, no, actually when we moved to the new uh, facilities behind the, the uh, uh, performance hall, we had about the same amount of space that we had before. But it was uh, coalesced into one, one building and made it much more convenient. Mm, that's great. Um, so, uh, the art department, uh, <clears throat> you've been here, you were here 29 years, and I'm um, so explain I how, taught here 29 years, Explain yeah. in the beginning how there was the 27 units, most teachers taught the 27 unit classes for, like, oh, well, classes. at the time, uh, <laughs> the first few years I taught as a full-time faculty member, it was possible to be an adjunct instructor and teach as many hours as you could stand, <laughs> and there were... There were full-time teachers on campus who taught as many as 25 to 27 units as an adjunct instructor without full-time benefits, and it was a very interesting time. Um, many people made full-time jobs out of, out of adjunct teaching. It reached a point where the college was sued by one adjunct teacher for benefits that they felt that they and they deserve for teaching so many hours. I've forgotten whether the college won or lost that. I believe they lost that action. 
legal action. And at the, and from that point on, the legal limit that an adjunct instructor could teach as a load was nine units. Mm -hmm. And so that was remarkable change and resulted in many more adjuncts coming on campus. And so do you feel that um, having, you know, teachers where there's more, we were talking about the more part-time teachers and stuff, that's um, not benefiting students as much as having more full-time instructors? I, I think it, the students are fine with it. I think that the college loses some of its cohesive nature when when there are 400 part-time instructors mm -hmm. versus 60 to 80 full-time instructors. Okay. I think that ratio is, is something that's happening nas nationally and is, is a matter of financial exigency. I understand why it happens. Mm -hmm. It's all a matter of, of cost and so but I think it, there's a certain amount of of coordination and cohesive quality that is lost when there are so many desperate people um, teaching. Oh, for sure. Separate instructors that only have a, a small duty and then they go to some other job or another part of their life. Yeah. But maybe I'm just an old-time uh, traditional uh, instructor. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> All right, so um, my favorite part. Um, explain the flying to the different places like Page and Fredonia and Black Hills. Oh, yes. <laughs> when I first started teaching Aaron for the first decade, if not longer, I think it was until the early 90s that the Coconino uh, Community College District was established. Before that time, uh, Yavapai College had uh, jurisdiction over the entire northern part of Arizona from Black Canyon City clear to Page and Fredonia and adjunct teachers taught classes offered in the Yavapai College course bank all over the state in elementary and high schools from like I said Page to uh, uh, I'm trying to think some of the cities Flagstaff, we had quite a, a large offering. Um, cities in Winslow, um, uh, Williams, uh, all over. And during that process, when adjunct teachers taught Yavapai College courses, it was our responsibility on this campus to coordinate those programs. And so we occasionally, each of us would fly probably a couple times a semester to some outward location and help uh, the program, help coordinate the program. And we had some interesting times. I flow, flew into the Fredonia Airport one time to meet an instructor uh, from the uh, local school who was teaching an art class. And I was supposed to be picked up. No one ever showed up. I just sat there. I didn't have cell phone, of course, and the, the terminal was closed, and there was no way for me to get ever, anybody. And when it was mighty cold in the middle of the winter, and I remember thinking, you know, what's going to happen to me? And I, I just sat there the whole time, and and uh, finally the pilot flew back to pick me up, and I went home. Oh, no. Another time, uh, we were flying into Baghdad, and. Uh, Tom Logan, this most excellent pilot, had to buzz the uh, runway to scare the cattle off so that we could land without hitting one. And uh, another time, uh, Elaine Farrar, who was one of our art teachers, um, the cargo door in the back of the twin-engine plane that she was flying in opened and lost all her supplies. So it was kind of a wild and woolly and exciting time. Oh, for sure. Seems uh, ancient history. <laughs> Feel free to get a drink anytime, too, if you'd like. Um, okay, so explain uh, when you came to Prescott um, how Prescott was, uh, you know, as far as the rural community and the surrounding areas. Well, Prescott was a small city of about 22,000 people, mostly uh, in one unified area, what we know as. Greater Prescott now, and 
Prescott Valley was a motel, a Chevron station, and Antelope. That's all. Nothing more. <laughs> and during the time that I've been here, this exponential growth has taken place to the point where I think Prescott Valley now is a larger population than Prescott. Mm -hmm. And we've expanded everywhere we could on every road artery out of town. So mm -hmm. it's a substantial change and quite a different kind of lifestyle than when I came in the early 70s. Things were relaxed and uh, it was the, the flowering of the hippie era and mm -hmm. we were just coming off dress code regulations at Yavapai where people couldn't wear jeans and shorts and things like that. And it was a bizarre time in many ways. And uh, the oh. faculty were uh, expected to dress properly and conduct themselves very conservatively in town. And uh, I remember thinking it was quite a change from where, what I had experienced in California just <laughs> the year before. Oh, wow. So Yavapai had a dress code. Well, it was right at the very end of it. Yes, they were just trying to hang on to it, but it, uh, there were too many challenges, and finally I gave up on it. That's a good thing. <laughs> I think so, too. Uh, so, But the 70s was a time um, of change as far as like in the art department and stuff, and um, a good sort of change. Tremendous expansion, a lot of community support for the art department. Lots of people from town were interested in painting and ceramics and they were extremely supportive and did a great deal to make our lives uh, very comfortable as instructors mm -hmm. and uh, became our lo lifelong friends. Oh, wow. And um, as far as like the change in art, what kind of changes in the actual art forms did you see? Well, the main big change uh, from that I could see was the change from a... a, a materials-based experience or you work with clay or you worked with um, materials, woodworking, canvas, paint, all of that to the digitized experience of the technological expansion where people started doing art on computers and uh, it hasn't stopped since. And mm. now a great deal of what we do happens in digitally and not not on the actual materials themselves. Mm. Explain how you uh, introduced the graphic design program to Yavapai. Well, the very, very first start of it, I don't know if I can remember the model, but I think it was the Apple IIe computer became uh, the graphic user interface. And at that point, uh, Vince Kelly, the ceramics teacher, got very interested in graphics and he, he um, somehow bought one of those machines and started teaching computer technology to two or three students. <clears throat> Within a couple of years, Dr. Peterson uh, started bringing in computers in the graphic design department. And in the school service art department, they used computers. And um, then many, many years later, after I had become... Uh, the division chairman, uh, we developed a really fine computer lab. Uh, I think that was probably mid-90s mid or a little earlier in the art department. And within a two or three years, the business uh, division became very computerized. And so it, it was fun to watch the genesis of it and to see what it is now. I, I marvel when I walk around campus and see all the technologically driven instruction that's going on. It's, uh, you know, it's very, very inspiring. What do you think are the, the pros and the cons of uh, turning from more uh, material-based to more digitally-based art? Well, I've always been uh, a sort of a Robinson Crusoe type where I do everything myself, build cabinets or houses or or electronics or whatever. <clears throat> and so my whole life has been oriented towards a materials-based uh, existence where I solve problems in a material sense. Mm -hmm. 
and all the processes and the machinery and that go with that. But as I notice now, it's hard to find a young person that I can talk to about how many threads per inch on a bolt and how, you know, and what tool does what process and all of those kinds of things that have been such a part of my life. And it sort of makes me sad that we've become a replacement oriented society from my view instead of uh, people who take pride in keeping something running and repairing it and refurbishing it and, and all of that. And I realize it's economic and expansion of capitalism and so forth, but to me it's it's sad to see some of the old um, hands-on, up-close and personal, smelly, noisy, dirty things <laughs> taking place. Your experience on campus. Um, name some of the best memories that you have of on-campus experience. <sighs> I had a student named Rex that lived in a tent on the hill behind <laughs> Building Four, in the juniper trees. That was funny. He took his he'd take his art supplies back there, and it took about two semesters before our campus security finally chased him off. That was a fun memory. Um, <clears throat> my memories of long travels to go to places like Window Rock and and Ganada. Uh, and to visit jewelry making programs in in uh, Indian high schools, uh, things like that were were very very strong in my memory. Um, I learned I liked the camaraderie between the full time faculty when we <clears throat> when we first got started. I found those uh, experiences where we were close and friendly with uh, everyone in the faculty and the administration. The faculty was the largest group on campus and the support people, administration and, and main maintenance and operations were a much smaller segment but as things became more demanding and federal programs required I've noticed that the college now is becoming pretty much balanced between instruction and support and technology and maintenance and all of that. So it's it's quite a change I've experienced in that respect. It's <clears throat> amazing. Um, but uh, you've studied other places as well, other than Yavapai College. Yes, I taught at Pepperdine. I taught at USC Idlewild campus in California. And I was an art coordinator for um, 33 33 schools and, and uh, 13 junior highs and seven high schools in mm. California. Wow. And so I, I experienced a tremendously large district and all the things related to it. And then I came to this small, as I characterize it, Cowtown College. That was one of the best things I've done, I think. Uh, it was a good decision. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> So, uh, with all your experiences, um, what are you doing now? With all <clears throat> I'm a part owner of a gallery on Whiskey Road called Van Gogh's Ear. I wasn't part of naming it, however, I'm <laughs> living with it. And we have 11 uh, Prescott area artists who um, do their art and present it in the gallery. And then we have 35 or so consignment artists that also show their work in our store. And it's been interesting to change from the life of a pedagogue where instruction was my daily thing to now becoming sort of a small-time capitalist, I guess. <laughs> uh, so if we were to go to the Van Gogh ear, we could see some of your work? Oh, yes, you would. Oh, I have a lot of jewelry and a small amount of welded uh, sculpture there, things that have held over from my teaching time. I taught many years of welded metal sculpture and regular sculpture. I taught three-dimensional design. I taught art woodworking, which was furniture making and, and carving and sculpture. And I taught jewelry making um, for, like you say, 29 years. Oh. And so what are, you, uh, what are you most comfortable doing? Or, uh, what is your favorite uh, art form that you do? I believe all materials are 
similar in in the way you handle them. And to me, uh, I'm sort of a generalist in a world of specialists, I'm afraid. <laughs> and so I, I feel as comfortable doing woodworking as I do metalworking. What is the uh, what was the one that you taught the most at Yavapai? Were they kind of even as far as what you taught? At one time, we taught nine jewelry metalsmithing classes, wow. and at one time, we taught four woodworking classes. Uh, sculpture has always been three or four sections. There was a lot taught in outlying areas, but here on this campus, it, the sculpture has always been in my experience, the smallest. Mm. And so I sort of moved between all of those uh, in my years here, and then I became uh, a division chair when I wasn't teaching except one or two classes, and I found that to be less satisfying for me. Mm. I'm more of a hands-on person. Oh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. So, um Going through, you know, Yavapai College and stuff, you've seen a lot of students pass through. And um, are you still in contact with any that have gone on to into the arts that are... I'm successful? still in contact with many who became my friends, and mm -hmm. a lot of them in town, some of them have gone on. Um, <clears throat> several of my students have been, become very successful in what I taught them, mm -hmm. and it's that's very fulfilling. But what's really nice to me is have a student who... You have to scratch hard to remember their name, come up to you and say, they had a really meaningful experience in your class, and they enjoyed it, and they still remember it. That's a that's a big pat on the back to me. Oh, that's cool. So uh, we talked a lot about, you know, like the good things that happened at Yavapai and stuff, but what are some not-so-good memories that you have or some things that um, you wish would have gone differently here at Yavapai? Well, I, I'm realistic enough to know that some of the changes that have happened are are necessary and expedient. It just seems like, uh, as in our regular lives, it, it becomes more and more sterile and more impersonal, and our lives become more numeric uh, as, as life goes on. My one salvation is that from 1984 until now, I've been involved as a volunteer with the Friends of Yavapai College Art. Mm. And I've been involved intrinsically with the development of the gallery and the sculpture garden here on campus. And there isn't a week that doesn't go by that I don't have something to do with helping the sculpture garden grow. And we're right in the process now of acquiring three new pieces for the garden after a wonderful expansion of our infrastructure due to a lot of volunteerism. And the one thing that's kept me really grounded towards Yavapai College is that project and its progress. And... Uh, Every time I visit the sculpture garden and sit there in the benches that we've sold and the sidewalks that we've raised money for, I feel a certain smug satisfaction. It has, in my view, uh, contributed a lot to the enjoyment of the community, has, has contributed to the art instructional program, and created a small four-acre four park out of a out of an area that was used for dumping broken concrete and brush. And in my view, as the population increases and things become more personal, we need a quiet, contemplative space <clears throat> where we can um, be at one with our own intellect and see some beautiful things and that are... that are 100 percent the responsibility of, of this college and the community that supports it. So uh, through Yavapai College's history, then the community has done a lot of support. Uh, has, has it always supported Yavapai College? Yeah, you know, the community, um, some people like Gene Phillips and several other members of this community <clears throat> uh, pushed the development and founding of Yavapai College. Mm -hmm. And so it has remained true to that, to that I think. Um, 
and I think has, has always had a, a wide base of community support where the students aren't mostly matriculating, they're mostly community members who are trying to, you know, expand their education and enjoyment. Oh, for sure. And I think that's, that's the perfect nature of community colleges. I'm a little upset that <clears throat> we have fallen away from the technology department where diesel mechanics have been taught, where auto mechanics, where electronics, um, welding technology, and all of those things were an integral part of the campus. Now they tend to be pushed out away from the central campus. And I think... Uh, Functionally, that may be an answer, but to me, it kind of separates the different things we do and contributes to the dehomogenization of our intimate culture. Mm. I don't know if you agree, but I do. No, I really do agree. I I found it most enjoyable to walk over to the electronic shop or the <clears throat> or the uh, welding shop and talk to the instructors, and now you'd have to travel some to do that. Oh, yeah. So, okay, well, um, just kind of wrapping up, what advice would you give um, some art students or people coming up in the art world um, about Yavapai College or about um, the arts in general? <clears throat> well, the, the, the sort of the cliche response to that question was develop a really strong portfolio of your work from the very beginning that you can take places and aid to your future mobility mm -hmm. and to spend a great deal of time doing a, an excellent museum quality job of developing a portfolio that shows your skills. It'll help you through your entire future and I think that's still true although the portfolio may look a bit different, you know, more electronically driven. Yeah. Um, I think you can get a wonderful experience in, in the arts here, and it's the same all over the world. The, the growth of the student is largely the student's responsibility and isn't somebody else's. And I think that if you keep that in mind and take advantage of what's available, you can do marvelous things starting out in Yavapai College. Any final thoughts? <laughs> Any final thoughts at all? Or? No, I'm, I'm, I appreciate this. I'm sorry my voice is cracked <laughs> up. I hope you can edit some of this out. And, <laughs> and uh, I, have no, I have no regrets for choosing the, making a career out of working in Yavapai College. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Rackerson. <laughs> that was wonderful.